Okay, let's get started with the <laughs> cognition side of chapter seven. So last week we talked previously about how the brain processes information, how it stores information, and that's the memory side of this chapter. So you have memory, and then you have the cognition part. So today and tomorrow we're gonna to talk about the cognition part, how the brain processes decisions based on the information that's already there, right? So the first part is memory, the second part is decision making, problem solving, things like that. So there's something interesting here that we'll talk about tomorrow, and that's how language develops. And you probably haven't thought about this, but it is significant. When children start to learn how to speak, it's not just that they're forming the words with their mouth, like Broca's area of the frontal lobe. It's also that they're learning concepts, right? So memory and knowledge kind of go hand in hand, right? What is knowledge but a semantic memory? It is a memory that you have created of information rather than an episode. An episodic memory obviously is an event. So you create a memory of an event or you create a memory of knowledge. Semantic memories versus episodic memories. But all these things we know are explicit hippocampus processes. So young children have a limited capacity to learn language for multiple reasons. They have a hard time conceptualizing things. I mean, literally like creating concepts, but they also have a hard time remembering things because the hippocampus is developing late. So imagine, if you will, and like I said, we'll talk more about this tomorrow, but imagine, if you will, how children progress in their language. You get one babbling, they're trying to verbalize, but it's really just probably mimicking what their parents are doing. Then you get into this one word stage where they're learning things. And that's an important part of concepts. Right? That's kind of where we're gonna start. All right, so think about cognition, and you know this buzzword cognition, you've seen it before. Cognition is not, neurobiology. Cognition is like the mental processes that happen. Cognition is like, if, if, if you get a question, in other words, like, what is it that, that cognitive psychologists study? Thoughts, memories, knowledge, all of those things are cognitive processes. If it says something like, doctor so-and-so is analyzing dreams, that's gonna be psychoanalysis, right? So if it's, dreams are kind of one of those weird scenarios where is it a cognitive process or is it not? Most of the time on a test, dreams equal psychoanalysis. So they're gonna tell you thinking, knowing, and you guys are already good at this on the test where it's like, you know, you see the buzzwords for cognition and you know that it's cognitive psychology, right? That's what you're looking for. It's a thought process. It's some kind of memory, including knowledge. That's cognition. So you look at the, the things that you're studying. So memories we covered. We're gonna get into concepts. That's the basic structure of like human conceptualization of the world. This is where language begins, is with concepts, right? And you build on that. Once you create semantic memories of concepts, then you can make decisions. Really, and you make decisions, so I'm gonna say decision making and problem solving, right? Because a decision is like, I got up and I decided to get out of bed and I decided to get in the shower and I decided to get in my car and I decided to go to work. Even if it wasn't a hard decision, it was still a choice, right? So decisions are like the choices that you make. Problem solving is more of the traditional like, do I eat lunch at Chick-fil-A or Whataburger, right? That's problem solving. It's still a decision, but it's a decision based on an outcome, right? Should I do A or B? So there's a difference. It's not very, it's kind of subtle, but there is a difference. So. We start language with concepts, and then we can make decisions. But here's the thing. There's two ways that we solve problems. One is an algorithm. We'll talk about that in depth today. And then another category is called a heuristic. An algorithm is the methodical, step-by-step. -step. It's got a mathematical connotation to it, right? It's an algorithm. It's a word problem. So algorithmic way to make decisions, solve problems, if you will and there is a heuristic way to solve problems. So the reality is this, when you, when you use a heuristic rather than the methodical step-by-step -step process, let me, let me say it to you this way, when you make a quick decision, you're using one of two things. You're using knowledge, previously gained, which is just nothing but a memory, or you're using your gut intuition. Right? So if you're driving down the interstate and it's a six lane interstate and three lanes are going east on I whatever, 80, and three lanes are going west on, on I 84, 
that's an even number that doesn't make sense i-85 so you've got to decide do i stay right or do i go left well you're either going to use knowledge well i need to i need to go east so i'm going to stay to the right or you're going to use intuition and if you don't know which left is east and right is east you're going to you're going to just intuitively think okay this feels like the direction i need to go and you can see the problem there right the problem is, is that your intuition is probably not as accurate as we like to give it credit for. And you're like, well, why did you decide to do X, Y, or Z? Well, it was a gut intuition decision. It felt like the right thing to do. Or why didn't you do X, Y, or Z? Well, it just, I instinctively, it didn't feel right. So let me say that again. Algorithms, they're not foolproof, but they are the, they are the more intentional, methodical way to make the best possible decision based on the information that you have, right? And there's problems with algorithms. We'll talk about those. But most of your decisions that you will make today or on any given day, really, for that matter, are what we call a heuristic. And that's either a judgment call or it's a gut intuition call. It's really your only two options, right? So judgment is problematic, <coughs> bless you, because judgment is based on preconceived notions, presuppositions, some type, some level of discrimination or prejudice, right? And, and when I say prejudice, I don't necessarily mean like racial prejudice, but like, I like this color over that color, that's a judgment call, right? So judgments are not exactly based on the best possible outcome, they're based on previous experience, right? So judgment call, prior experience, this is what I know, even if it's limited. That's different than intuition. Intuition is something totally different. And your study guide talks about that. What's the difference between intuition and a heuristic? Intuition is not based on past experience. It's based on some instinctive feeling that you have, right? So these are kind of the levels of how the cognitive process gets more and more complicated. And you look at them like young children are learning concepts. You're still learning concepts too, don't get me wrong, but they're learning basic concepts. And then they develop to a point where they can make decisions on their own based on outcomes. I like this food instead of that food. That's a decision. It's a value-added judgment. So they're making, they're solving minor problems, making small decisions, but then they're gonna get to the point where they can form judgments. This was a good choice. That was not a good choice. And that's the problem with underdeveloped brains, right? And you know this, we've talked about this before. If you have middle-aged, middle school-aged siblings, because the problem, the problem is they are capable of making decisions for themselves, but they're not very good at judging the correct outcome for those decisions. Then that's a higher level skill. So judgments that you make are based on assumptions and assumptions are based on perceived outcomes, which is based on your past experience, right? So the people who have more experience are gonna be wiser, right? It's not intelligence, it's wisdom. Wisdom comes from experience. So you're gonna make a judgment call and you're gonna know, no, that's not a good idea because I tried that in seventh grade and broke my arm, right? Or I don't see any reason why I shouldn't do that. And you jump and you break your arm, right? So we develop the ability to make judgments as we experience more life, right? So let's start with the basic level, which is concepts. It's kind of the first level we'll start with. Think about little kids and how they learn things. It's kind of this one word stage we'll talk about tomorrow. They start with, the most basic understanding of the world is in like nouns and verbs. So little kids will see things like, when I say little kids, I mean like toddlers, like, oh, well, this is mom. So in their mind, we don't know how they conceptualize mom. Mom is anyone over a certain age that looks like a woman, right? Unless mom doesn't look like a woman, and then that's the child's conceptualization of mom. Because the child, does, think about it, when you learn something, you don't assume, oh, okay, this is a thing, and there's other variations of this thing that I don't know about yet. That's not how the mind works. The mind works is like, okay, this is a thing. So a child's like, this is mom. I know it's mom because she told me to call her mom and I say mom and she's happy. So this thing is titled mom. And this thing is titled dad. And this is my brother and that's dog, right? So we have a dog and this is what our dog looks like and there's dog and dog's name is whatever, right? That'd be a good name for a dog. But dog's name is I don't know, Snoopy. That's my dog's name, Snoopy. And he's a little big old... He's really dumb, but he's cute and we love him. So the thing about this is if your child grows up in a house only having seen one type of dog, that's their concept for dog. 
Piaget calls it a schema. We'll learn about Jean Piaget in another chapter. Piaget is the child development specialist, right? He was investigating how the mind or the cognitive function of children develops as the mind gets increasing more, increasingly more complex, we'll say. So he would call this a schema. So a child develops a schema for what is a dog. And they don't think this is a category of animals. They think this is a dog. And the dog is a thing, and a mom is a thing, and a dad is a thing. And that's how they learn stuff. They develop simple concepts. But then those concepts expand. And this is what PSA calls schema assimilation. You learn that there are other concepts inside of this great... So it's not just one type of dog in the world. In fact, there are other animals that look like dogs, but they all fit within our conceptualization of a dog. Right? Now, we'll rotate concepts into prototypes in just a second but the point is is if i were to put this on the on the board and ask my four-year-old daughter scarlet what is this animal she would say that's a dog and she would laugh because she laughs every time she sees dogs it's cute and weird at the same time right or if i had this one what is that and she might say it's a puppy or some variation of dog that's a dog right or if i put that one so you see the point she has a concept in her mind even as a really young, underdeveloped brain, that this is a dog. And even though it looks different than this, that is also a dog. And I know you and I take that for granted because our brains are very advanced, but that's not an insignificant cognitive skill. To be able to differentiate between similar concepts, but they're not the same thing. So the child, even though they don't understand how, can conceptualize that this is a dog, and this is a dog, and this is a dog, and this is a dog, but they're different looking dogs, different types of the same thing. So this is how concepts expand into categories. So your brain likes hierarchies. Once it learns a concept, it adds details to the concept and subcategories, and then subcategories inside of those subcategories, right? So, and we'll get into that in just an exa uh, example of that in just a second, right? So concepts, you know the definition already, Mental grouping of similar objects, events, ideas, people, right? These are things that fit together. They are related. So already off the bat at a young age, the brain likes to compare things. The brain likes to compare things. It wants to know, is that a dog in comparison to this? So, and, and we'll get it again more with Piaget, but Piaget is like, you have a dog and you know that's a dog. Well, then the next time you see a little furry animal with legs, you're like, well, that's a smaller dog. And they're like, no, that's a cat. <laughs> Wait a minute. You mean there are other animals that aren't dogs? And then yeah, I need to sit down. Right? So every new piece of knowledge is growth for the brain. And that's why children are so fascinated by learning stuff. Because they, they don't take this knowledge for granted. It's new for them. And they have to learn animal sounds. And they have to learn categories of animals. And they have to learn that there are farm animals. Right? And they're developing schemas for these things. And they're developing prototypes for these things. Right? So when we learn... Jean Piaget, the French developmental psychologist later in another chapter, that's the vocab term. He calls them schemas or concepts. They are synonyms, they're the same thing, right? So let's take it a step further. What happens when we have a ton of different things inside of a concept? Well, we get what are called prototypes. And prototypes, you're thinking like Iron Man, like this is the prototype for the Iron Man suit, like the first one that was made, it's developmental, it's a concept, right? Prototype in the cognitive sense means this is the most readily available example of something, right? Think like Family Feud, okay? If you go on Family Feud and you sit in the audience, they give you a poll right before the show and they ask you to write stuff down. So let's say you were on Family Feud and they say, we want you to write a species of bird, Right? And you put your species of bird down. Well, then they're going to ask the contestants to guess a bird. And they get more points for however many people guess that. So think of it that way. Like a prototype is the most readily available example of a concept. Now, you can name lots of types of birds. But your conceptualization in your brain, the image that comes to your mind, is probably maybe a really generic bird. Like this one right here. And it's another example that your brain recognizes stuff, even though it's random, right? That's not really a bird. That's a flat, two-dimensional, silhouette shape with three weirdly wide feathers and no eyes for some reason and no feet. So, and it comes to a strange point. If it were upside down, you might not see a bird. But your brain puts that together. It recognizes the edges. It recognizes the shape. 
and the closest thing in your concept is that's a bird. It flies and has a beak, therefore it is a bird. In fact, it's an easy way to draw a bird, right? So if you were asked to draw a bird, you might draw a bird that looks like that one, right? Or if you live close to the beach, you live in Gulf Breeze, Florida, maybe your prototype for a bird would be something like a seagull, right? But you have understandings that that's not the only kind of bird, but that's the kind of bird that pops into your mind when asked to draw a bird or say a bird, right? So it's a conceptualization of things. And your brain likes to compare. So when kids learn different size shaped dogs, like we showed on the previous slide, the brain recognized them in comparison to a concept it already has, right? That's what Piaget calls assimilation. Your brain tries to make it fit. Is this like the other birds I've seen? Well, my best guess is that's a bird, but it's a different kind of bird. But I know it's a bird because it has bird-like features. It has wings, it has little bird legs, it has a beak, it's not a mammal, it lays eggs. So you have all these conceptualizations of what makes something a bird. And when you see something new, your brain compares that to its existing knowledge. And that's how you learn to conceptualize the world in concepts, categories, hierarchies, and prototypes. And prototypes are one of those judgments that you make, right? So when you think of something, there's a prime example that comes to mind, right? For example, right, if I were to ask you your, your prototype of a masculine man, okay? And you might think of like this one. Some of you are gonna need a minute, right? Probably what wouldn't come to mind would be this guy, right? That's probably not, <laughs> look at that goofy smile. Like RIP to the Frohawk too also, right? That's probably, let's just take him off of there. Like I don't feel like I belong on the same slide with this human being, right? That's, but that's a prototype, right? And that's where we, we get cultural prototypes. We get not so much like ethnic outside of culture, but we get, we get prototypes that are based on our geography, right? Like maybe if we lived near the equator, our prototype for a bird would be a flamingo, right? I don't know. But whatever your conceptualization, the prototype is what personifies that. Right, so if you grow up and, and, and you learn to idolize people like this and like that's your prototype of masculinity, it's probably a pretty good call, honestly, right? Then that's, that's what comes to mind, right? You think of like mysterious, dark, stoic, probably six foot three, you know, 230 pound, whatever he is. Where is he from, New Zealand, right? So don't act like you don't know. You're like, oh, he's from the town of whatever in the province of what? Yeah, you know where he's from. Where's he from? Is he, is he a Kiwi? No one in here knows that's people from New Zealand? Huh? Yeah, that's Aquaman. That's Jason Momoa. He's from the ocean. He just came up out of the depths. Right? I wonder if there's more, more of them down there. Right? So, yeah, we're going to look. So here's, here's the thing. This is a kind of a funny side note. I was like, I have to put, like, somebody that's gonna make the females croon here. So I thought about, well, well, who's a track? So I'm gonna type hot guys into Google. And I'm like, no, that's probably not a good idea. I don't need, I don't need that in my search history. Where's he from? Hawaii. Hawaii, okay, not New Zealand at all. I lied, I'm sorry. I thought he was from New Zealand. I don't know why I thought that. He's from Hawaii, awesome, right? So anyway. That's the example that comes to mind. So when you get questions or ex when you get examples on a test of like, what's a prototype? You have to just think like, what's the most likely one that people would say? Now, another good example would be like, if I tell you to name a brand of car, or if I tell you to write the logo of a university, you're not gonna write your favorite one necessarily. I mean, maybe you will. You're gonna write the one that pops into your brain, the one that's most readily available in your brain. That's one that, that's, Right? It's prototypical. It's available in your mind. Right? So let's move, let's move on from that. We can't recover from that. So if we were to create a chart, this is from your book, of how the hierarchy process looks, it's probably pretty similar to this. Right? And, and here's kind of an interesting way to think about this. When a child learns that there is a dog, that's the prototype, but that's also the concept. That's the category. So in other words, they don't assume, oh, a dog is one type of animal. A dog is one type of mammal. The dog is one species of this genus, and they don't know all that. They learn objects, right? They know nouns and verbs. So like, you know, eat cookie, that's how kids learn. Then we get to the two word, or what's called telegraphic speech. It's this idea that they're, they are like interacting with their world from objects or nouns 
and action words like verbs. So how do they learn things that are good? Like they go to like touch a light socket and their mom smacks their hand. Oh, well, that was bad. We got to file that one away. It's something we don't want to do again, right? But they learn, this is where it's kind of backwards, right? You learn the specific concept first, and then it expands into a hierarchy as you gain more and more and more knowledge, right? So in other words, what started out as this is a dog, ergo, this is all dogs. Then you learn there are other dogs that don't look like this dog, and you've expanded your concepts to include other categories. Like we have small dogs and big dogs, and dogs are animals, and there's other types of animals. And there's farm animals, and there's domestic animals, and there's wild animals. Like if you were to ask a child, like an elementary school child, to draw a farm animal, there's a prototype for that. They would probably draw a cow or a pig. They wouldn't draw a cat necessarily, but almost every farm I've ever been to had at least one, if not 17 random cats running around, right? Or they'll draw a chicken. So they have conceptualized and categorized, not only are there different animals, there's different categories of animals. So this is kind of significant, y'all, honestly, because as we expand our brain's conceptual, conceptualization of things, we're, we're increasing the scope of our hierarchies, if that makes sense, right? So when you first learned that math was a thing, they didn't sit you down in, in, in kindergarten and say, we're gonna learn math. What's a math? Is that like where I wash my hair? I don't like to math. That's right before I go to bed. And they're like, no, 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 no. What do you learn? You learn that we have objects and that we can count them. We can quantify them. So you don't say we're gonna learn math. You say, how many apples do I have? Well, I know those are apples and I know they are red. And let me count them. One, two, there are two apples. That's the beginning of conceptualizing math. It's the beginning of calculating things, quantifying things, and then you progress from there. What if I take one of them away? <gasps> Where did it go, right? Now I have one. So it starts, that's why it's like so amazing to watch little kids learn because like their little minds are just consuming all of this. But let me say that again. You start with a basic concept and as you expand your knowledge of the world, you expand the scope of your hierarchy. So you guys are not fascinated by taking one apple away. You guys are like doing calculus. Maybe not well, but you're doing calculus. You're in calculus class, we'll say. You're, you're enrolled in calculus, okay? You go to calculus every day. You own the book, right? That's what you're doing. But you have a much higher hierarchy or, or, or we'll say conceptualization because you've had time to expand that. So this is where language starts, concepts of the world, right? Then you get to the point where you use the knowledge that you have, which is semantic memories. Knowledge is nothing but a memory of information, right? So you use the semantic memories that you have to make decisions. So let's get into the decision-making part. Little kids can't make decisions because they don't have concepts, right? They're not deciding between one outcome and the other because they have no idea that their action will lead to a specific outcome. That's a type of knowledge that they don't possess yet. That's why they're so curious. That's why they try to die constantly, like walking out into the street and touching sharp things, right? So again, we, we beleaguered this point, so we won't do this, but if I told you to draw a bird in your notes, right, it would probably be something like this bird, right? Similar to that shape. It probably wouldn't be something like this, right? Because that is a bird, but that's not your prototype for a bird, right? Now, there's another term here, maybe it's not your prototype anyway. Maybe you drew that because I primed you to draw that because I keep showing you the Twitter bird, right? So that's an example of priming. What are these like subconscious suggestions that make you think about something enough that you put it down or you guess it, right? So let's get into some other examples of categories. Now we live in a country and a culture in the United States that likes to categorize people. We have genotypes and subgenotypes and ethnotypes we're one of the only cultures in the world that subcategorizes our people by race and by ethnicity. And I think we do that for identification. Right? People like to identify with their ethno group because most of the people who live in America are not ancestrally native to this continent, right? But we subcategorize people. You don't go to any other country in the world, like you're in Ireland and there's black people there and like, well, I'm African I Irish. They don't. They don't say that, right? They are, okay, I'm black, but I live in Ireland. That is my nation of origin. So your ethnicity is different than your race. But man, we like race in America. 
We like to ethnically genotype people. We like to we like to do all kinds of stuff. We have subcategories. We have conceptualizations because we live in a country with a bunch of different cultures. So we make judgments based on previous experience with those cultures. Now, where prejudice comes in is when your previous experience with a culture is not actually based in reality, but it's based in something that is perpetuated, right? Something that's wrong. So if you grow up like anti-Semitic where you're like racist towards people of like Jewish heritage, that's probably not based on negative experiences with every Jewish person you've ever met. Or maybe it's a very small sample size. There was a guy in your second grade class and he was Jewish and he beat you up and therefore you hate all Jews, right? And that's, that's something that kids do. I mean, little kids do that, right? Until they learn to expand their conceptualizations of people, right? So like what happens is you see the conceptualizations of people when they join together, their Venn diagrams start to overlap, right? So like you're a black American, I'm a white American, but we're teammates. It's just like overlapping parts of the Venn diagram. And then you don't start categorizing people by their concepts. But we do have categorizations. And we do use them for basis of things like arbitrary identification. And they do simple tasks. Like this experiment is detailed in your book. Basically, it says once we place an item in a category, the memory shifts towards the category type. So if we show somebody a picture of someone who visually looks ethnically Asian, and then we blend that person's features with someone who is Caucasian, we already have created that presupposition. It's kind of like Loftus's false memories that we talked about yesterday. It's this idea that once you introduce information to the brain, it can alter your perception, right? So the Loftus example is a little bit more complicated. It's kind of like, okay, what happens if we put presuppositions in the wording? So you might say, okay, listen, you're a witness to this crime. How fast was the red car going when it sped past us? Well, there's some presuppositions there. First, you're presupposing that there was in fact a car. Second, that that car was in fact red. And third, that the red car was speeding. Now, none of those things had to be verbalized. You just assume that they were the truth, right? Because that's what your brain thinks is the most logical outcome, right? So if you look at this, it says a computer generated face that was 70% Caucasian led people to classify it as Caucasian. But if it was 70% uh, of the features of the Asian man, then people identified it as being an Asian person. Now, if you notice, that their faces are similar enough, right, in skin tone, in hairline, in the structure of, of their, their, well, the bottom of their nose, the top of this guy's nose is, is fairly pinched compared to the top of this guy's nose. But you see they, they have similar chins, similar mouth profiles. So they, they, the picture superimpose pretty nicely. So if you make a 70% Asian, people will identify that person as being Asian. And you see this a lot in our country also with skin tone, right? If you have someone like the Tiger Woods scenario where one of his parents was Asian, the other of his biological parents was black, African-American. Well, his skin tone is dark. He looks like a black man, right? So people might identify him as being black because that's how they categorize him. But he's spoken several times in interviews about how he doesn't, he kind of fits in multiple categories ethnically and culturally, right? And that's the beautiful thing about the United States. But the reality is, is that we like to conceptualize things. We like to put them into categories. We like to identify them against our categories, our preconceived notions. First, we have to learn concepts, create notions. Then we use those notions to make decisions, right? And as we learn from our, you know, our puzzles that we did, sometimes our preconceiving notions can prevent us from being creative and thinking of a basic, uh, a pretty obvious answer, we'll say. So let's transition from now we've created all of this knowledge. How do we use this knowledge to make decisions? So this is the decision making part. And again, this is implicit. This is something that you do so many times throughout the day that you probably take it for granted. You make decisions constantly. Every few minutes, probably you make decisions. So how does your brain use existing knowledge, semantic knowledge, let's call it semantic memories to make decisions? Well, let's start with the trial and error. This is a type of algorithm that you would use. And I like the example of the battleship game. Because if you want to play a frustrating game that takes hours, your options are Monopoly or Battleship, okay? So this is an example of an algorithm because if you want to find out where the boats are without cheating, as my son has figured out is the easiest way to win at Battleship, why don't you just look at them, Dad, and then you know where they are. Oh, awesome. Thanks for the tip, right? So without cheating, the way to find out where all those ships are 
is to methodically guess random spots until you hit one. It's my turn. A1. Miss. Sweet. 17 more turns before I maybe hit something. Right? It's a very methodical, it's very slow. But if this game were to continue on long enough, guess what would happen? We would find every one of the battleships on the board. So there's pros and cons to the trial and error approach, right? Which is a type of algorithm. If you take a set of keys and you're like, I don't know which one of these is a house key. Let me try all of them. For some reason, this Honda key won't fit in the house. Now, you wouldn't do that. You would go, that looks like my preconceived notion for a car key. That's a heuristic. That looks like my preconceived notion or prototype for a house key. So you wouldn't use an algorithm. You would look at the keys and guess, right? Which you can do. So you're not gonna use an algorithm for everything. But there are times when you should use an algorithm. And not all algorithms are trial and error, but all algorithms are methodic, right? So methodical, and again, it's a mathematical term, right? It's like step-by-step, -step, arithmetically, like some type of arithmetic. So we've got this image of an algorithm being a math problem. There's multiple steps to it, right? And I look at your, again, your calculus paper and I just see like, I just see like lines and letters and I have no idea what's going on. There's logs floating down the river somewhere and signs and cosines and I don't even know, I don't even know what, I, I don't even know the words. I can't even use the verbiage, right? But that's the connotation here for an algorithm. It's a mathematical process. Step one then move on to step two, then move on to step three, move on to step four, right? It's methodical, right? So let me give you some examples of when you would want to use an algorithm, right? An algorithm is something that you're gonna do if you really, really, really need to make, make the best possible decision and you've got some time. Where do I go to college? Algorithm. Not you walked on a tour and went through the quad and you were like, this place feels right. Where do I sign up? Right. That's more like, where do I eat lunch? At Chick-fil-A or Whataburger? That's a heuristic. The algorithm is when I need to make the best possible decision and I need to weigh the options and I have time to be methodical about it, right? Here's a good example also of how your brain is unlike a computer. Now, a computer can do algorithms very quickly. In fact, if we gave this to the IBM's Watson, their server, it would run all of the 907,208 possible letter combinations in a matter of seconds and tell us, that word is psychology. But which is the, that would be the algorithmic way to do it. Right? It's not trial and error, it's an algorithm. You're trying every possible combination. But there are shortcuts. In fact, you just made a judgment call based on the class that you're sitting in. The most likely answer is psychology. Now, if you were a freshman and you've never taken a social studies class on this campus, and you're not in psychology and we give you this word scramble, it probably would take you a few more minutes, especially since psychology has a silent P at the front, right? So you have preconceived notions, but you also have intuitions and your gut intuition tells you the most likely answer right here is psychology. So you didn't use an algorithm for that, but you did come up with the answer, right? So that's the advantage of your brain. One point for your brain over the computer. The computer is much faster than you at algorithms, but it has to do everything algorithmically. Now, if we don't use an algorithm, we're using a heuristic. And a heuristic is a shortcut. That's the best possible single compound phrase that I can give you as a synonym for a heuristic, is a shortcut. And you're making these shortcuts based on intuition or based on judgment, right? That's the heuristic way to make this approach. So we'll just look at the word heuristic and then we'll break them up into the two categories tomorrow. So the heuristic says, what is the most likely possible decision that I could make or should make in a short period of time? It's a judgment call, right? And judgment calls are not always accurate. That's why first impressions are important, right? Do you want this lady to babysit your kid or this guy? Now, he can be a perfectly acceptable human being. Maybe he's a dad, right? Maybe he rescues puppies, right? Maybe he's a super nice guy. We're not supposed to judge people, right? Well, but we do, but we do, right? So we'll look at the two different categories of heuristics tomorrow. We'll look at representative heuristics versus availability heuristics. That's what we'll do tomorrow. Yes. This one, yeah. I, I did the one for last week. It's already up there with the memories. Uh, it's, I, think, I think it's on the calendar. You have to go back to whatever day we did it on the calendar.